Hello and welcome again to another episode of This Song Sucks, a podcast where three pals get together and talk about the music that we hate. Today is a little different. No Hayden Crawford, so hopefully just as chaotic, though, because we have Lindsay, Lenzoid Prime Polinsky. How's it going, Lindsay? Hi, Josh. It's it's great. Everything's wonderful today. <laughs> You're so excited. I can <laughs> I'm just so excited. feel the... Just, <laughs> And a new guest today with us, all the way from New York City, Toby almost got in a fight with an old man at a jazz club singer. How's it going, Toby? (laughs) I forgot about that. (laughs) Oh, my God. I really did almost probably get the crap kicked out of me by like an old war veteran or something. (laughs) Yeah. Toby is good friends with Lindsay, and I have less experience, but one of them is very memorable, and that an old man... (laughs) was upset with us for standing in front of him uh, in line to get drinks at a jazz club. And on his way back from the bathroom, he just like shoulder charged you basically just like, yeah, he gave me a hard shoulder. I think at that time my hair was particularly tall. And so it was, you had like the side shave. Yeah. I had the side shave. And so like, I think like he was a little bit frustrated with just like, me being like six seven while seated for no reason. Yeah, I mean we're well we're both we're both talls, so right uh, that kind yeah, of yeah. As a tall, I understand like his pain. <laughs> My recollection is <laughs> is he 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 hit into you very intentionally, and you said really. Yeah. <laughs> and as he was sitting down, he goes, "Try it." <laughs> oh, that's right. Oh, my God. Sorry. The pandemic has melted all anecdotes from the last five years. <laughs> and that is a really good one. I forgot. Try it. Yeah. Try yeah. it. Like talking to some nerdy, skinny musical theater dork from New York. It's like, hey, man, you look like you're itching for a bruising. Try it. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> Hi. That boomer was very upset because, as, yeah. you, as we all know, the most important part of a jazz show is seeing all the middle-aged white men on stage. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. That bitch probably likes Annie. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us to today's topic. Lindsay, what are we going to be talking about today? We are going to be completely destroying my least favorite song in the entire world from my least favorite musical in the entire world, which is Tomorrow from Annie. And I will say, I hate every song in Annie. I just also, like, Tomorrow was just the easiest target, I think, because the most Mm -hmm. people know it, but I absolutely despise the musical Annie and all of the music in it, and Tomorrow sucks. Okay, well, I mean, I guess you kind of not burying the lead here. We don't need the rest of the episode. That was pretty much, we covered our bases. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we're having both Toby and Lindsay on because I guess we could we could call you musical theater nerds, right? Sure. Sure. And that's, that's a realm that I don't have as much experience with, so I will be relying both on Toby as a fellow musician and Lindsay as a uber theater nerd. To help me get me through this episode, Toby, as a person who writes musicals, and Lindsay, as a person who <laughs> criticizes them, <laughs> including Toby's, including musicals. I've been criticizing Toby's music for years. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, rather um, than talk about the creators of the music like we normally do uh, when we have a band's song we're talking about, I'm just going to kind of go through a little info about the musical that I found online. Some of it. Um, Interesting would be a good word. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we'll just jump right in. The musical itself, Annie, is is based on a comic strip called Little Orphan Annie, written by a dude named Harold Gray. And the strip ran from 1924 to 2010. And actually, the strip itself was based on a poem by a guy named James Riley called Little Orphan Annie, with a T. Orphan? Mm. Apparently, that's how, they, that's how they spelled orphan in 1885. That's how RuPaul would say it. Orphit. Orphit. Because she says entertaining, because she just adds extra T's. <laughs> and taints. I'm not sure that's what James Riley was going for. It was like Absolutely de- not. He probably wasn't deep in the drag scene. Orphit? 
Yeah. It's, what? It's just put okay, a yeah. put a T I'm, in the end I, of orphan, and you got it. Little orphan Annie. I'm just gonna and add T's to words starting now. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just just some notes on the poem and the comic strip before we jump in the musical. So as I said, the poem was written in 1885, and it introduces this character of Annie, and she's at an orphanage telling all these other orphans these stories about goblins that come and snatch bad children away. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's way cooler than Annie in the musical. <laughs> well, there's really only two stories. One is kind of oddly sexual and that a kid disappears and all that's left is his pants. Ooh. So that's kind of weird. Oh my God. That's weird. And then the other one talks about the quote unquote black things that'll come and get you. So, you know, you could imagine what he meant by that in 1885. We hate it. So... That's 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 rough. Yeah, we're off to a rough start <laughs> on the origins of all this already. What is that uh that Christmas demon that steals children? Krampus. That are Krampus. Krampus, yeah. So this feels like sort of like a Krampus like takeoff almost. But also racist. A racist Krampus. Racist yeah. Krampus musical. <laughs> Honestly, if they made a remake of Annie and Annie was just Krampus. <laughs> yeah. That'd be fine. A pantsless Krampus. Perfect. She's telling all the children these stories about a demon that comes and steals them, and she's the actual demon. She's the demon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> makes total sense. So, anyway, going on to the comic strip, um, as I said, it ran from a really long time, beginning in 1924, so like right before the Great Depression, which the musical was set in 1933, but <laughs> the strip was largely kind of a mouthpiece for Harold Gray's ultra-conservative pro-business views. <laughs> so, like, d the character of Daddy Warbucks is kind of painted as this, like, compassionate, benevolent, conservative titan of industry. A, a real, like, libertarian, do all the work so all the poor people are okay kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But favorite targets of Gray's were uh, organized labor, communism, and, of course, FDR and the New Deal. So much so that he hated FDR so much that... <laughs> When he was elected, he wrote Daddy Warbucks to be dead, like he died, but then eventually just wrote it back as he went into a coma and then came out of the coma when FDR died in 1945. Wow. Because, quote, a character like Warbucks couldn't live in the same world where FDR was president. Oh, mm. no. Mm. That's got some... Some modern resonances. Yeah, and as we'll, as we'll see later, and as anyone who's seen the musical, uh, FDR makes an appearance in it, and they don't seem to be too at odds with each other. So anyway, the musical itself, it actually first premiered in August of 1976 at the Goodspeed Opera House in Connecticut. So an off-Broadway premiere. It also apparently had a brief stint at the Kennedy Center in Washington, which I couldn't find the exact dates on when that happened. But it wasn't too long because it actually premiered on Broadway in April of 77. So this musical was, the music was written by a guy named Charles Strauss, lyrics by Martin Charnin, and the book by Thomas Meehan. Strauss is also known for writing the musicals Bye Bye Birdie and Applause. Oh, I also hate Bye Bye Birdie. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. That one I hate much more actively. That's good. <laughs> So he also wrote the score for uh, the 1967 film Bonnie and Clyde. So he's somewhat of a prolific composer of various quality, you could probably say. <laughs> the lyricist Charnin, he's credited as writing like dozens of stage works, both on and off Broadway. Nothing really that I recognize. I mean, it was a huge list. I'm sure if I showed it to y'all, y'all would probably recognize a few. But he actually began his uh, career as a performer as one of the Jets in the original production of West Side Story. <laughs> oh. So he's, he's been, he'd been around and been working in Broadway forever. Right. And then Meehan, the book writer, he also wrote the books for The Producers, Hairspray, Young Frankenstein, and Crybaby. I love mm. all of those musicals, though. How uh, did he go I so do. wrong with Annie? I, I, I don't know. I mean, the, <sighs> the book is just basically the script, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Essentially, wait the sa the guy who wrote the songs Strauss, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I believe he also wrote the songs to All Dogs Go to Heaven, if I'm remembering Ooh. correctly. I don't remember. It, that might be it, but it. I think there was a Disney movie soundtrack or two in there that he was involved in as well. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember it for the record. Any of the songs from that 
fucking movie. And that was like the first movie that I think scarred me as a very small child. Cause like, I think that was actually like my introduction to the concept of death. Okay. It was just like, what do you mean? You mean my cats are going to die? I remember like distinctly actually asking my parents this after this. I'm not kidding. Like, I think that was like my Aww. like window into the, 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 the next realm. Um, so, so fuck you, Charles Strauss. Yeah, see, this is good. You're getting, you're getting really hot up about Charles yes, Strauss. I love it. Yeah. That's exactly what yeah. we need right now. Setting up, setting yeah. up real good. <laughs> So anyway, uh, Chardon, the lyricist, first approached me and the book writer about writing a book for a musical based on the comic strip Little Orphan Annie as early as 1972. And apparently Meehan researched by reading prints of the old comic strip, but he was unable to find any satisfactory material for a musical other than just the characters of Annie, Oliver, Daddy Warbucks, and Sandy, the stray dog. So he just wrote his own story using these characters. And I'm like, no shit. You couldn't find any characters from a comic strip that was essentially capitalist propaganda written during a period of American history where, like, the country was completely destroyed by the excesses of capitalism. Like, who wants to hear that shit in mid-1970s when we're once again going through, like, like, terrible economic hardship? Yeah, and then just like throw in Judge Louis Brandeis just so you can get the Jews mixed in with it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because like at the end of the day, it's just like, you know, at the end of the day, you want to like try to fit in an anti-Semitic trope. And what better way to do it than the like most prominent, you know, Jewish judicial figure of the 20th century. Yeah, totally. Makes perfect sense to me. Absolutely, absolutely. Also, we just have a song singing about how much we hate Hoover also in this musical. Right, right, right. I forget some of these songs. The message, apparently, of the musical seems to be uh, in direct antithesis to what Gray, the comic strip writer's whole shtick was. So, I mean, if the guy was, I don't I think he had died by the time the musical came out, but I would imagine he's not happy, would not be happy with the musical's uh, sort of bastardization of his views, I guess. <laughs> so the show was written in approximately 14 months, and I mean, is that... A long time, Toby, or is that a short time? That's a short time. I mean, I mean, the deal is that Broadway shows can take anywhere from something like that to oh, I don't know, twenty years, as in the case of the MJ musical that's finally <laughs> making an appearance. You know, it took a fucking pandemic. Wait, MJ is in Michael Jordan? Michael Jackson? No. <laughs> okay. The Michael Jackson <laughs> I don't know why musical my brain went there immediately. <laughs> They've been advertising that musical on the side of a, a building yeah. for like, God, when was the last time I was there? Three years ago, I think. Yeah. No, they've been waiting. They've been basically <laughs> waiting for what's the right time to do a Michael Jackson yeah. musical? Never. And just like, never. Yeah. Well, the answer is never. But the apparently what it took was like a worldwide societal trauma on the level of this pandemic to be like, hey, guys. I guess this is the time to do it. Yeah. Do you think they were like ready to do it? And then that documentary came out where those two guys were talking about how they were molested by them. And they're like, crap, now we have to wait another five years. Probably. Honestly, honestly, they, they have had, I be, my understanding is that they have had a theater a number of times and it just hasn't worked out in some capacity or another. Mm -hmm. And this was like their window because a bunch of shows closed and they're just like, okay, we got Grab it. it. Maybe it's, it's, it's actually Macbeth Jackson. Musical. Uh, a regular theater Fine. joke from Lindsay. Yeah. yeah all right. You get musicals in Shakespeare. No regular plays. I, I don't mean, I don't know any regular plays. Neither do I. That works out. Yeah. Well, we're talking about musicals today, so who gives a shit about regular plays, right? That's right. Yes. So anyway, the show was written in 14 months, which Toby confirmed my suspicion that that's a very short time. Um, mm -hmm. But yes. it took a near, nearly another four years to get the show on Broadway due to lack of interest from producers. Because um, it's bad. Again, no shit. It's a, it's a kind of a dumb premise. But apparently it got picked up. Obviously, the original Broadway run lasted for six years mm -hmm. for a total of 2,377 performances, uh, which is a record for the Alvin Theater at the time. There are also, and so the show, I think, ran until like 1983. Yeah, so mm -hmm. 77 to 80, 83, six years. And in that time, there were four touring companies that were launched over the course of the original production. Uh, I don't think they're all running at the same time, but it's just like 
you have the Broadway show going on, and then, of course, there's like a London run as well. But, I mean, pretty much any time in that six-year period anywhere in the U.S., you had a chance to see the original on Broadway or one of the touring companies. So it was just everywhere all the time. The Hamilton of 1977. Yeah, yeah. It's also possible that those touring casts were running at the same time. So before the pandemic, Hamilton had three touring casts running at the same time because oh, okay. they hit different they hit different parts of the country. And another like seven sit down productions across the world. Yeah. Like money producing machine. So is like the touring company that goes through Branson, Missouri, is that like the bottom of the barrel, like for the cast? Yes. And <laughs> shockingly enough, that's usually the touring cast that comes through Austin, Texas, because there aren't a lot of Southern stops for musicals. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just imagining like. A production in some shit town and like it's you have like a De- Danny DeVito type in a red wig like on stage <laughs> <laughs> you're not too far off you're not too far off the touring the tour that of Book of Mormon that came through a few years ago I have seen community theater plays that were better produced than the touring company of Book of Mormon and I was just like wow we are in onesie pajamas as costumes cool <laughs> So they probably had just been in Branson, Missouri. Well, they had just been on the road a really long time. Yeah. You know, cut them a little slack. <laughs> okay. Or don't. The The original production uh, obviously was popular. It was also nominated for 10 Tony Awards, winning seven of them, including Best Musical, Best Book, and Best Original Score. Was nothing else out that year? So Hair, Hair and Jesus Christ Superstar came out in the fall. So they would have been in the 78 season. Like, Man of La Mancha came out in the fall. Oh, There's I love like, Man of La Mancha. I also love Man of La Mancha. I was, I was in Man of La Mancha. I could not sing, but they cast me anyways. It was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so just uh, some interesting things about those Tonys. Both Andrea McArdle, who played Annie, and Dorothy Ludon, who played, what's the name of the head of the orphanage. Miss Hannigan? Yeah, Miss Hannigan. Miss Hannigan. They were both nominated, and Hannigan won instead of Annie, interestingly enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. It also won Best Choreography, Best Scenic Design, and Best Costume Design. It also, in 1978, won the Grammy for Best Cast Show Album. Uh. So, you know, mm-hmm. it was just, it was taking everybody by storm. The Academies by storm. Yeah, although I'm now, like, looking at what came out in the fall of 76, and just like, no shit, it won. Yeah, like, so Annie was up against Happy End, I Love My Wife, and Side by Side by Sondheim, which was oh, yeah. only one song because it's Sondheim for Best Musical. Yeah. <laughs> oh, get that dig into Sondheim. I'm gonna. I'm going for it anytime anyone brings up Sondheim. Nobody is safe in this episode. <laughs> Wait, was Fiddler on the Roof? Came out in 76? Is that, is that yeah, right? Yeah, Fiddler was the year before. It was, and it won, right? No, 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 no. The original Broadway production was no, back Chorus in like the Line, 60s. It won the yeah. 30th Tony Awards. It was Chorus, yeah, yeah. ooh, Chorus Line Chicago, yeah. Pacific Overture. Oh, yeah. All right. That was a good oh, year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And then Annie just comes and takes <sighs> a big wet shit all over it. Yeah. Yeah. So I-, I made an effort to try to understand why the fuck people like this musical so much. Children. Well, yeah, yeah, that's essentially it. Screechy so I, children. I tried to find some, like, reviews written at the time in 77 for the original production, and I found one that came out, like, two weeks. New York Times, you know, they archive all their stuff. Yeah. So this is from a, a, an article titled, Seven Splendid Reasons Why Annie is a Smash. And those seven splendid reasons were the seven orphans. It's basically just a write-up of these seven girls that play the orphans in the show. And the author of the article is just gushing about how down-to-earth all the actresses are because they aren't, quote, like, regular showbiz kids. Because apparently Charnin, who also directed it, wanted to get, like, rough-around-the-edges kids. So they wanted actors that weren't the child actors to, like, not be polished, I guess, would be the way to describe that. And I mean, it's just, it's really kind of creepy and weird and has all kinds of like sexist undertones about how they talk about the, first of all, the children, but also like the mothers of the children. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a quote from later in the article I want to share where it's, 
It seems to kind of refute this take that these aren't like Broadway moms. But quote, a few stories have filtered out out of the close mouth company that indicate that the stage mother syndrome may not be entirely dead among the Annie moms. While the show was still in Connecticut, it is said one irate mother whose daughter had lost a line of dialogue to another girl waited in the bushes and leapt on the other girl's mother and wrestled her to the ground screaming, it's all your fault. <laughs> oh my God, that's better than Dance Moms, the TV show. <laughs> but I mean, this whole article, there's very little written about like, the show, the content of the show. <laughs> it's just like, here are these kids. Look how cute they are. And there's a dog. I bet there's like, yeah. oh, my God, a live dog on stage. Uh. Uh, I don't think they mentioned that. It's really oh. just all about the kids. So you're, what you what you said is right. It's just like, I guess America at that time just needed to see some fucking kids singing on stage. <sighs> but there was also another Times article written by Meehan in 81. Mm-hmm. So it's about, you know, halfway through the original production run. Me and again is the book writer of the musical. He gives his impressions of the initial reactions to Annie. Quote, we got our first TV review shortly before 11 o'clock from Stuart Klein, the WNEW theater critic. And Mr. Klein confirmed all my worst fears. Annie, he said in essence, was yet another sorry example of a show that had bowled them over out of town, as we had in Washington, but that had absolutely no chance in New York. The musical version of Harold Gray's beloved American comic strip, was a turkey, a bomb, a total fiasco. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, sounds great. I'm like, we got it. <laughs> but then Mian continues later in the article saying that other television reviews began to come on the screen and all of them turned out to be flat out raves. Mr. Klein's strongly negative review was, in fact, the only bad review we got that night. All of the other TV reviews and several newspaper reviews that came out later in the early hours of the morning were wildly favorable to the show Annie. It wasn't a hit. It was a smash hit. So again, that's taken, take the context of that's the guy who wrote the thing talking about it. But again, I couldn't find any other contemporaneous articles talking about the actual content of this musical. Because there is no content. (laughs) Can concur. And I just feel like it's such an example of there was like a gap basically in the season. Like there wasn't, there was some like pretty heavy, hard hitting stuff like in previous years. Yeah. And then like, it was just like a fluffy spring where this like dumb musical with some kids got to happen. I mean, I have some hot takes about like the Great Depression aspect of it mm-hmm. and just that there are better musicals about the Great Depression. <laughs> yeah. There's like better musicals about depression, you know, yeah, in general. I- I saw, I found this other one thing, but I don't even want to like cite it because it was like a dumb listicle thing, like seven reasons yeah. why we love Annie. And <laughs> uh, basically one of, one of their items was that like when it came out, you know, it was in the middle of a recession, inflation was going up, all that kind of stuff. And like American audiences just needed to like have a happy go lucky musical with kids pulling themselves out of poverty or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And so it just seemed really full of shit and nothing to really back that up. <laughs> yeah. It's just like gas costs like $8 a gallon, but damn, these kids sure can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> but they can't. That's that's the real. That, I, it's yes. in my notes yes. for later. Yeah. So moving right along, this is a, so, you know, they made a movie of it in 1982 and I did find Roger Ebert's review of the movie from, I mean, there's several movies of it, but this is the original movie. And here's a sing- here's a quote that I think sums up his opinion, which I agree with 100%. The story is about little orphan Annie. She's rescued from a cruel orphanage by a billionaire who wants a rent an orphan for Christmas. This is said to be a universal story. <laughs> <laughs> Critics have written that you just can't help cheering for Annie as she faces the cold world with pluck and courage. I didn't find myself cheering much, though, since Annie didn't seem to need the encouragement. As played by the feisty young Eileen Quinn, she is the sort of child who makes adults run for the hills. <laughs> oh. But, I mean, he ended up giving it, like, he said, it's stupid and dumb, but I enjoyed watching it. So, like, you know, Ebert has this is known to have this kind of objective eye for movies, and he's saying all these things that don't make any sense and just are objectively make it a bad movie. But at the end, he's like, nah. It's all right. Yeah, I mean it. It's like 
centering this like very uniquely American concept that has led to all sorts of economic trauma over the last 40 years, certainly. I mean, it's funny that this like this came out like a couple years before Reagan because it's like the beginning of the true careful, slow demise of the American middle class really begins, I think, in 1980 again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you have this like musical about like like a poor kid and like getting plucked out of poverty, but not like into like a relatively comfortable like middle class existence with like a loving like adoptive set of parents like there's a version of annie it's like weird like the like the i know that there's like the the fake parents that like come and they like want to like you know like cash in on that reward Mm -hmm. yeah but what's funny about it is that like the fake parents probably would have just like given the kid like a perfectly reasonable like no they wouldn't (laughs) have no no they wouldn't have because the fake parents were miss hannigan the evil abuser orphanage lady brother and his girlfriend Mm -hmm. so they were just gonna take her right back to the orphanage where she would get beat with a broom right okay no that's a good point but there's just like there's a version of this where it's like a a wholesome story of like somebody like of like supporting children in getting out of poverty but instead it just skips that step altogether yeah yeah yeah. and turns it into an american fantasy well and i think that it's also like for at the time now Ebert's an old white dude, but at the time he was a middle aged well, white a, dude. He's a he's a dead, he's dead white dude now. Yeah, but uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> but like at the time R. for R. like <laughs> these these it was very aspirational for like middle aged white dudes to picture themselves as Daddy Warbucks. Like one day when I'm rich, right? When I'm a billionaire, a magnate mm-hmm. of industry, I'm the gonna ultimate lie of conservatism. Right. One day right. when I when I'm rich and fancy i'm gonna adopt a cute orphan and then at the end of the play make all of my friends adopt all of her cute little friends you know like Mm -hmm. so it's very much like when he ebert that review i think you mentioned that he said like ah yes this is a like about the plot line of daddy warbucks like adopting annie at all didn't you say it was believable like a universal plot line yeah Apparently, it was a universal plot line for like. There's really the his reasoning is he just wants an orphan to come hang out with him on Christmas. Yeah, which is just really bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> which feels like a weird kink. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but Toby, to your to your earlier point, like about it, if it had this musical come out in like '87 toward the tail end of the Reagan era, right? Like right, the New York right. Times review like would have called Annie a welfare queen. But you know? the thing is, <laughs> is that true. that musical toured and there were so many like high school and community theater productions of that musical in the late '80s, early '90s that yes. clearly mm-hmm. it's still like it it was not criticized in the way that we as modern people would think it should be should have been criticized in the late 80s mm-hmm. after all right. of this yeah. you know yeah so let's we'll we'll finish this uh the talk about the musical with just one more final fun fact apparently uh one of the original replacement actresses for Annie in the original Broadway production was uh Miss Sarah Jessica Parker <laughs> and there's actually a, a, a video I found of her from like 81 or 82 where they took a bunch of act, like the young actors and actresses and had them sing to piano company. So there's a very young uh, SJP out there singing her heart out. She still looked 40. <laughs> 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 All right, let's dive on that note. Let's dive into the song itself. Uh, I'll just have s- some notes before we start talking about the music. So for those who haven't heard it, go listen to it now. Pause the podcast, go listen to it. But just a little info on the song itself. Tomorrow is actually a reworked version of a song that Strauss had written previously for a short film called Replay. Uh, and the song mm. is called Replay, The Way We Live Now. And I could not find audio of this song or the film to watch online. So I have no idea what it sounded like originally. Probably terrible. Probably also terrible, yes. <laughs> is it like the way we live now is something? That's probably. <laughs> probably. I mean, it sounds like he just like, he did the thing, the scrambled eggs, like McCartney thing. Yeah. Thinking about a replay. <laughs> It's a film. Well, I thought you couldn't sing, Lindsay. I I do sing. It doesn't mean I'm good at it. Homegirl can sing. Lindsay, keep singing. No. Apparently, he also used the song in the pre-production 
for the musical Charlie and Algernon, which is the adaptation of the novella Flowers for Al- Algernon. And that was mm-hmm. that was happening while Annie was still like trying to be picked up. And then as soon as Annie and the song Tomorrow got famous, he dropped it from that musical. I mean, so it seems to me like Strauss was convinced that no matter what, the world needed to hear this turd of a song <laughs> by all means. You know? uh. I mean, as somebody who has on more than one occasion written a song and then shoehorned it into different pieces of larger scale art because... I like the song so much. Like I can empathize with yeah, that. Yeah, I mean there's nothing Just wrong with that. Bit. Artists and composers do that all the time in all sure. mediums. Film, yes. bands, musicals, whatever. But right. like usually they're better. Yes. <laughs> it's like better material. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the song occurs three times in the musical. The first is when Annie escapes from the orphanage uh, in act one and she comes across the stray dog Sandy and I guess kind of adopts it. The reprise of the song, the first reprise, is in the second act. It has Annie and Warbucks singing the song with Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt in the White House. I mean, could this be any fucking dumber? There's, like, really no pretext in the story, as far as I know. He's just like, let's go to Washington and bring Annie along. Because they're rich, and that's what they do. And then, and then that song <laughs> inspires the New Deal. Yes, that's the whole thing, is that she sings this song to FDR... And the positive message in the song is what inspires FDR's New Deal. And FDR starts singing, and he prods uh, Warbucks to join in and by saying, come on, even the Republicans can join in. <laughs> and then the third time, it's, it's played at the end of the musical, right after the nearly as dreadful song, A New Deal for Christmas. Which is the Oof. opening number of the sequel to Annie. Ugh. I don't even want to get into the sequel to Annie. <laughs> oh, God. As we all know, it's called Annie 2, Electric Boogaloo. The, the, there, no, there was Annie 2, Miss Hannigan's Revenge, which failed, but there's the actual yes. sequel is Annie Warbucks, and it was yes. by the same guys. And yes. um, A New Deal for Christmas is the opening number of that song. And I, I did Ugh. briefly look at those, mostly just to see if they were as popular, and they, of course, were not, and uh, were not nominated or won any sort of award. So it was... Clearly a stinker. Fool me once, shame on you. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. The world only needs one Annie. (laughs) Hey, everyone. Just want to jump in here for a minute to let you know that we now have official This Song Sucks merch for sale. We've got t-shirts, hoodies, stickers, and coffee mugs available. Head on over to thealabamatake.com and click on the shop link at the top of the page. You can also pick up all the other Alabama Take goodies like the fan favorite Done Up Real Good t-shirt. Again, head to thealabamatake.com and follow the shop link. Thanks for your support, and now back to the episode. All right, now we're going to jump right into the things that we hate about this song. Everything. Yeah, I'll kick it off. Toby, you can jump in. And oh, yeah. I think, I think we'll probably have it is just... In- the last 10 minutes of this episode is just going to be Lindsay yelling about the musical <laughs> and the song. So you'll just have to kind of, I mean, feel free to jump in, Lindsay, but like, you know, let's try to keep it down to a, a level for now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I've said this multiple times on this podcast in different episodes, but I'm just not a huge fan of children singing. You know, so there's just one big strike against this song and the musical itself just right off the bat. I mean, I I don't really have an objective reason for it, but just every time I hear a child sing, even if they're like a good quote unquote child singer, they're still not good. Right? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I mean, I can chime in on this because this is a big point for me is like all of these songs that are written for kids are written for the most part by like middle-aged Jewish men. <laughs> and and the reality of that is like as a <laughs> approaching middle-aged uh, <laughs> agedness Jewish man, like, hi, my voice is here. And I write songs in a, a way that is reflective of the instrument that I have and, mm-hmm. and a whole host of other factors, blah, blah, blah. It's not that I don't write for my for other people, but there is implicitly a a way that I am writing a song that is for an adult voice, even if I'm trying to write a song, quote unquote, for a kid voice. And the fact is, is that this song never fucking sounds good in anyone's range. No. 
period. No, it's, it's- and particularly not for developing vocal cords on a like nine year old. And it's like, it's also only four notes. So how can you get those four notes so wrong? <laughs> well, I think you're talking about uh, the, t- at the end, the tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you tomorrow. That, yeah. But I mean, it has an odd range. And the, I, I looked at it in F and it goes from like B flat up to E flat in, o- in the next right. octave, which is again, kind of a weird range because you're, tonic note is f and it's kind of weird to go up to the e flat and not hit the f above it right it's it's again that's that's kind of technical details about bad melody writing which i'll get to here in a second but do you have anything else to say about child singing well it's just like from a musical i mean the number of like belty musical theater ladies that i've encountered whether it was in like undergrad or just like out in the professional world you you find that these folks that definitely sang Annie when they were a kid and it has shredded more young women's voices mm. than almost any other character that I can I can imagine like just from like r- not giving ourselves a bunch of other singers in the world like just like it's a node machine is that a better way to put it <laughs> yeah so like asking a child to sing tomorrow is kind of the equivalent of asking an adult to sing what's the song or defying gravity at the end of yeah. Wicked, right <laughs> yes it is the nine-year-old's version of defying gravity oh my god it is but defying gravity is better yeah defying gravity oh, is a defying good song. gravity <laughs> defying gravity is a great song and and actually I, I i mean i would love to do a, a rip a hole in some stuff from wicked but the <laughs> um just in so many ways but the uh I think that it's just like you're having children leap and scream these belty high notes that are in no way built for their voices, I think is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to imagine that McArdle, the actress that played Annie originally, was probably, I didn't really look into it, but it interested to see what her career was like afterwards, if her voice was just completely gone after doing it for six years. My next point is on the lyrics. Two kind of issues. Uh, the first is being specific, but the line at the end of the song, tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you tomorrow. <laughs> and I, I, I remember hearing this, you know, I mean, I don't know how old I was. I was probably a young kid. I didn't do musical theater, but this song's fucking ubiquitous. Everybody knows it. And it always seemed to me that that I love you was just shoehorned in and like really fucking lazy lyric writing. Yep. I mean, I get the impression that the lyricist needed something to re- say other than this repeating tomorrow again. So he just said, ah, fuck it. Let's throw I love you in there. They'll eat that shit up. <laughs> well, she, she loves the concept of tomorrow because tomorrow is a fresh start. But if you really think about it, that's kind of like fucking sad, right? It's very because sad. Because that, that means today is never going to be good. <laughs> well, because none of her todays are good because she's an orphan. Exactly. With a mangy dog. I mean, if, if any sort of like <laughs> scrutiny is given to these lyrics beyond just like, oh, a cute kid is singing about, you know, how a great tomorrow is going to be. It just all falls apart. And this line to me is kind of indicative of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the... The true dark pit of nihilism is most obvious to me on the line, you're always a day away. Yeah. (laughs) And it's sung like, I mean, like, like, hold on a second. Like, just the, like, you're always a day away. And it's such a, like, simpering, sweet little resolution to the progression. Mm -hmm. And that is dark. (laughs) Like... Like she is, she is acknowledging at this point in the story that she will never get there. She will never get there. It's not an "I want" song. It's no. a "I I am doomed" song. And then singing that to FDR. I mean, I, I don't even want to get into that. Well, I, and I, that that phrase also happens on that kind of descending baseline chord progression, which has a kind of dark sound to it. So it's like. I feel like there's might be a way to do like take that piece of the song and arrange it in a way that like an adult sang it that had sort of a weird juxtaposition of like darkness against this sort of on the surface happy sort of positive outlook. Right. But you don't get that when it's a fucking kid singing. 
Right. And in the middle of the song, she gets like a, a cop approaches her. For being on the, for being a child on the street, yeah. for vagrancy, yeah, and for like having a stray dog, and it's when she has to prove that the dog is answers to. Well, it's okay. So, like in the middle of the song, there's dialogue, and she, the cop is like, "What are you doing, child?" And she's like, "I'm here." And he's like, "What dog is that?" She's like, "That's my dog." And he, what's its name? And she's like hemming, and oh my god, his name is um, it's um, it's um, Sandy. He's like, "Oh yeah, well then, let me hear your dog come to his name." And she's just like, um, Sandy, come here, boy. And then he comes magically because it's the magic of theater and hope and joy. And he comes and she's like, oh, my God, Sandy, I love you so much. And then they're inseparable forever or something. But it's just like then she sings the second half of the song and it's like supposed to be hopeful. But again, it is actually super nihilistic. It's that it's that Uh, classic uh American story of criminalizing being poor. Yep. And then she wanders into a Hooverville immediately after. Yeah. <laughs> immediately. But yeah, I mean that's I mean that's generally my second point about the lyrics is, you know, I'm not a fan of the sort of sappy cheesy song, but as we've talked about the context of the song within the musical, if you really look at it, it's pretty fucking dark. <laughs> yeah. And it's like about this the whole musical is about this dumb like ultimate rescue fantasy and like I have to imagine that audiences at the time were not really looking at it that way and just seeing it as a sort of a Hallmark card Norman Rockwell bullshit, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like you have, I love the conceit of a song that has devastating lyrical content that is sort of sheltered within, I'll say something that sounds joyful musically. Mm -hmm. I've always loved that conceit. I have dabbled a little bit to say the least (laughs) in that conceit, like in, in just like as a construct, but there's like a point at which that just ends up feeling fake and it ends up feeling, I mean, and this is just confused. It's kind of the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I mean, it's like, well, I mean, the music is, I think the music is fairly, like, bouncy and happy. It's got and trumpets. Has, it's got fucking trumpets, <laughs> trumpets. because it's Broadway the in the 70s. <laughs> no, that's, that's, I think that's a good point. So, my next biggest picadillo about this song is the awkward rhythmic structure of the melody. Specifically, <laughs> that first downbeat of sun will come out, leading into out on beat two. I mean, you have that pickup, the sun will come out. And what's happening is like you're emphasizing the weak beat too there with that out, the longer note, and de-emphasizing that strong beat with those kind of rapidly clustered notes. And so the overall effect, and it kind of continues into the next measure, is that you have this elision of the meter where the strong beat, the downbeat, doesn't feel that way. And you're not really resolving it until tomorrow of the third measure. And, you know, normally something like this could be used to a pretty cool effect. I mean, you hear like this kind of thing in like modern big band arrangements all the time where you're kind of shifting what the metric center is. Right. But in the context of the song, because it happens right off the bat, there's no context of like what the normal meter is. So he somehow managed to have something that is normally hip and cool just make it sound awkward and uncomfortable yeah i mean what's weird about it to me like okay putting my musical theater composer hat on for like a half a second it's like you have essentially what is sort of a a recitative moment Mm -hmm. like in a different musical that would be that would be a kind of singing talking yes it would it would uh, yeah exactly so it would be it would be there would be sort of, and you saw this a lot of in earlier musicals where you have sort of like a free form sort of opening section mm-hmm. and the sun will come out. Like that would be probably part of a longer structure that is not intended to be the beginning of this, like for better or for worse, iconic melody. And it always sounds like a mistake. Mm-hmm. Yes. To exactly. me. Like they're late. Yeah. Like they're late or they fucked up the rhythm, or they have a bad music director, or some bullshit. Um, <laughs> all of the above. And I think all of the above, because it's just like, the sun will come out tomorrow. Like, there's a way that it could be done that would feel more, 
consistent and just like this is the melody. I tried to 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 arrange it and I couldn't. I believe you. I mean, it, <laughs> this 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 is what goes into my next point, which is not something specific about the song, but I think this specific aspect about the sort of rhythm of the melody feeds into yeah. this. But it's it's an observation, you know. So I I come from jazz education background, right? And sure. a very large portion of the quote unquote great American songbook, which makes up what you would call jazz standards, come from musical yep. theater. You know, think like Gershwin, Rodgers and Hammerstein, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But and I'm not like this I don't claim to be like this jazz maven or anything, but like I've never played or never heard a group play <laughs> this song. And yes, granted right. this musical came out well after like decades after that sort of heyday of where that material comes from. But the fact right. that it's such a hugely popular song makes me think that it would be played by like jazz combos and that kind of thing at, at a cocktail hour or whatever. Right. Right. But I haven't. And I think it's just because the song is poorly written. <laughs> because the song sucks. Yes. I mean, if you get also into the weeds in that first phrase, like the expression, the sun will come out tomorrow. Like, where should the accent be from a word perspective? It's probably the sun, the sun will, come, will out. come out. The sun. The, but it's just like the sun, the sun will come out tomorrow. It's probably sun and tomorrow. And in this, those are the words that are not. Yeah, out is the word that's emphasized. The sun will come out. Like, who would say, like, hi, it appears that the sun will come out. (laughs) The sun's coming out. (laughs) I'm actually, I'm just having this thought now where it's like, I don't think this was (laughs) what he intended when he wrote it. But you know how, like, kids just talk too fast when they run out of breath? Yeah. Do you think that's what yeah. he was doing? No. Because <laughs> it kind of no. sounds like that. No, because none of our nieces and nephews are stupid enough to talk like that. But, you know, the, the kids where they're just like, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then this happened. And, uh, and then. No. No, it's just a bad song. No. <laughs> no, what happened, I think it's very simple. I think there was another set of lyrics, like you were saying, the song existed mm. before Annie. And who knows? Maybe those lyrics that we can't discover, like, fit the sort of rhythmic structure in a way that was more convincing of, oh, I don't know, English? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. So, I mean, that's that's kind of... Uh, those are the items that I have on my list of things I hate about this song. Uh, Toby, do you have anything that uh, I, we haven't talked about yet that you'd like to add? I think my big problem with this song is that I always envision that there is another section of music that never actually happens. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, the whole song... I, look, I am... I will stand hard for short songs. I love short songs. I write short songs. There's nothing wrong with a song that is two minutes long. It's... that That's not a bad thing inherently. But this song has always, to me, felt like there's, like, another bridge. It builds to nowhere. That's in my exactly. notes for what I want to yell about, is that, like, you get <laughs> the big build at the end of the first verse, and then it drops dead immediately, and she starts whining again. And then it builds to an instrumental break, which is where the dialogue happens between her and the cop, yes. A-C-A-B, and then it builds <laughs> to the end, and then it's the end of the song. I mean, I, I think I get what you're saying, Toby, because... Again, going back to the the jazz thing, I mean, most of what the jazz people play are the chorus, right? right exactly. of, of the uh, of the actual song. Like you have the verse part, which is normally like a rubato sort of, not metrically. It's a more of a recitative kind of thing, and then it goes to like, oh, here's the actual song. It's a thirty two bar form, and so right. it never. This song never gets that at all. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 what Lindsay is saying, though, that it just, like, builds and builds, and then we just drop down to this awkward, like, low, like, Roman numeral three on the scale. And it's just like, and also, like, that's the thing where you're killing this kid's voice. 
It's just like you're building them up to like what is like even on a low key, like a belty ass fucking like C or something. Mm-hmm. And then you drop them down to the basement. It's just like, yeah, the sort of come out. <laughs> and like, and it's, yeah, I mean, I think this song that comes to mind again from the same era, actually, if we think about chorus line, Lindsay, particularly, um, there's this, oh God, this is going to bother me. I'm going to have to remember which song this is. But there's a particular song that has, it is kind of the tomorrow of Chorus Line. It's sung at the end by 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 Cassie. What's what's the? Uh, at the end by Cassie. Like the big, it's the big like ballad at the end. The, oh, What I Did for Love. No, that's. Yes, What I. That's that's Diana though, not Cassie. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's Diana. I should know. Yeah. Jesus Christ. That, I, somebody should take away my card right now. Lordy yeah. Lord. But like, <laughs> so that song has a long tone bridge that you get to and it is the most and for the record i am a huge chorus line stan will never apologize for it it's an amazing show um despite having no plot <laughs> <laughs> and i love that about it i it, know that I, it's about I know it has the a plot. chorus it's about it's right, about right. dancing it's about dancing right. and that's it's, it's the same as cats well, I was never in the chorus, so I guess I don't know. <laughs> but but the but the song has like it, you know, what I did for love, and then this ba da 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 da. Like it's this it's this this bridge, secondary bridge that finally comes, and when it does, it is so satisfying. But it's also like an adult ass woman singing as opposed to a child, so it wouldn't matter anyways. Mm-hmm. Anyways, Lindsay, start yelling. Okay. <laughs> and go. Okay. No, so, I have more, but I don't no, care. No, no, go, I'm going to turn the gain down on our microphone a little bit. Just to... <laughs> no, Toby, what else do you have? I mean, the stuff that I have is, 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 is mostly petty shit. Like, I basically think of Annie as a musical as shitty mame. Oh, yeah, it is. So, like, of when you're talking about musicals that are, like, based around the Great Depression, like, I really think that... Annie is like the worst of the genre because it's all about this just like fantasy land that's like ignoring the realities of like most of the country and just like, okay, you know, and like the name Warbucks is literally built. The joke is there. Like, it's just like everyone should get the joke, but nobody seems to get the joke. It's just like the only way they could have made it more clear is his name is daddy military industrial complex. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm just like, honestly, that'd be a much funnier musical. If like, (laughs) like, hi, I'm Alan military industrial complex, but like, I don't know why his name's Alan. That's fine. <laughs> his name is Oliver. Oh, it's Oliver. Danny Warbucks' name is Oliver. Okay, Oliver Military Industrial Complex, CIA. Also, <laughs> Oliver is about poor people with, like, rescue fantasies, too. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, like, Mame is about the fall from grace of a rich person who then has to re-imagine what, like, a good life is about and like you know mame also has a little bit of like oh thank god this like old rich white lady gets saved by another old rich white man and eventually she's fine but like they kind of get it at least for a while and then my my final two hot takes are never write a musical theater song that is sung to a dog (laughs) (laughs) yes because and I'm just like, because that to me is the essence of bad writing. Like, instead of finding, like, you know what would be a more interesting song is if that cop showed up right at the beginning of the song. And then, and the cop's like, oh, I'm going to, you know, put you in jail because you're poor. And she's like, don't do that, officer. Instead, let me sing to you a song about my aspirations of the future. And, Mm -hmm. like, that still would suck because the song would still suck. But at least (laughs) then we're we're watching a communication between a a human and a human instead of some fucking, like, schnauzer or whatever that, (laughs) like, they trained. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The whole time the dog is probably like... Are you going to give me a fucking biscuit or not? Hurry the fuck up. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, that's what maybe the cop is also thinking. Oh, right. <laughs> Yay. Um, and then my final statement, which is a perfect lead in to Lindsay just screaming for the next nine minutes, is I have literally had nightmares about the Annie logo. Oh, I know. She has no eyes. 
She has no eyes. Oh, she has yeah. dead. She's like it's like an Archie comic. Yes, is what she's drawn. Yes, like. it's like s- or Dagwood. Dead soulless saucers for eyes, and like I, I don't know if if there's anything that is more quintessential. Did you just freeze again, or are you just like? No, I'm holding my eyes in dead soulless saucers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Listener, you can't see this, but I'm making dark caves of my eyes with my For hands. For the record, look like very terrifying. You kind of look like Thank a you. moth. Actually, I am um, the next Guillermo del Toro. Movie, That's actually. fair. That's fair. <laughs> okay. So on that note, Lindsay, take us inside the world of a young musical theater actress. Okay. So I have a lot. Uh, I, I have a lot of childhood trauma surrounding Annie. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not laughing at your trauma. Yeah. So as Josh mentioned um, earlier today, I generally have a lot of childhood trauma surrounding redheads. Um, (laughs) I am I am like mortally terrified of Chucky the doll. I worked with a girl who looked like a Chucky and I couldn't be on the same shift with her because I was like I I would have like panic attacks working with and it was so terrible because she was the kindest, most wonderful person. But I was just like, I can't look at your face. It scares me. (laughs) And Annie is a redhead. I just don't like it. Problem child didn't like that movie. My my main trauma surrounding Annie is that I had a very close friend, like my one of my first friends. You know, you have those friends from preschool Mm -hmm. who just you're friends for a long time. She loved Annie, loved it. So any time any production of Annie was happening within like a half an hour to 40 minute drive of our hometown, we went to see Annie. I have seen Annie more times than I can count. Like I have blacked out entire years of my childhood. (laughs) That's how many times I've seen Annie and I've seen the tour, like the official tour. I've seen regional productions. I've seen decent community theater productions. I've seen shitty community theater productions. I have seen high school and middle school productions. I have seen every Annie imaginable and none of them, none of them are good. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't leave. Like as an adult, if you don't like something, you can leave. But as a five-year-old or a seven-year-old or this continued until we were too old to be watching (laughs) Annie year old, you couldn't leave because you're there with your friend and your moms and you can't just be like, fuck it. I'm out. Um, So I, I, I just, I can't do it at all. Now here's the thing. You all may question my taste because cats is my favorite musical, but I don't care. Annie is objectively horrible. And also cats like has no plot and is a dancer's musical. And so I understand why some like true, like singer musical theater people may not consider my credibility to be credible. Um, Lindsay low key love cats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. That's why I know we. That's why we've been friends for over. It's 20 years. probably <laughs> actually a bigger part of it than we realize. If we both like cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I've just I've seen every terrible type of child screlting this song. <laughs> screlting is a portmanteau. I heard from my friend Stephanie of Protest Too Much podcast, um, which is scream belting, yep. <laughs> and and it, it, it's just like. And again, as I said earlier, it it builds to nowhere. Like she starts with this like rushed intro that is very out of place. And then it builds. And all of a sudden she's just like, oh, the sun will come out. (laughs) Like where? Why? What? What happened in the middle there? We jumped off of a cliff, which is what I want to do every time I see Annie or have to listen to the song. And I have listened to every version of the song I could find on Spotify this past few days before leading up to this. I'm sorry. I, I know. Well, I wanted to be thorough in my research. And I will say that the Jamie Foxx, Kevin Zani Wallace movie version of this song was the only song, the only version of the song that didn't make me want to kill myself. It made me want to kill myself. So cool. <laughs> Got her. Well, piece. it's like, the the build and the drop isn't as aggressive. True. Like it has a lot of really bad like computer produced beats from the early 2000s that we have moved past and sound really dated. And the auto tune. Oh. And the auto tune. God, the auto tune. 
But I uh. will say that I would take an auto tune Kavanzani Wallace, who when it sound when she says I just stick out my chin, it sounds like she's saying I just tickle my chin. Um, <laughs> I will take that any day over like a tiny little befreckled white girl with a stage mom who is just like. <laughs> Scream it louder, Susie. You got to be a star. Is like your daughter getting the role of Annie, like the ultimate thing for a stage oh mom? Oh, my God. It's up there. Uh, yes. It is, so like as far as kids, because there aren't a lot of roles for kids in the Pantheon. Right. And that's this is like the one. When you get Annie, it is a capital B, capital D big deal. Yep. Because, like, and you're not just one of the Hard Knocks Life kids, which that song is a better song. I also have problems with Annie the Musical because I fail to see how it won best choreography when there are, like, three dance numbers in the whole show. But I guess, like, it didn't have much competition. There's nothing else going um, on. Nothing. Well, but Godspell was that year. I looked it up. Godspell was also that year. Godspell was only nominated for one thing, um, and it lost to Annie. But I guess Godspell's not really a dance musical either. Um, so I'm trying to hit my bullet points because I just am, am so rageful. Oh, with the Skrelting. She has no reason to do it because as we've talked about where it falls in the plot line, she's just, okay, we haven't talked about where she came from. So she tried to escape from the orphanage and got caught by Miss Hannigan. And then she sings her I Want song, <laughs> which is, I don't remember the name of it, but it's where she's singing about how she imagines that it's she called has maybe. Some, maybe where she has these um, nice parents somewhere who are going to come find her and she's giving hope. And that's the I want song. Also a terrible song, but not as terrible as tomorrow, because as Toby mentioned, you don't sing to a dog. She's singing to all of these other children. <laughs> She's singing to these other children. She's giving them hope. She's inspiring herself. She's having a dialogue through song. The The song maybe is a natural extension of the dialogue that is happening. And that's what a good successful musical number should be. It should be like the emotion has gotten to such a level that I have no choice but to sing about it. It should be that seamless. And that's what maybe does successfully. Sure. And then... This is after she has escaped the orphanage a second time. So she's gone. She's hidden herself in the laundry basket and got loaded up into the laundry man's truck. And she's just like wandering the streets. <laughs> and then she has this song that sounds like it should either be an I want song or an act one closer. Yep. And it is neither of those nope. things. She has this weird ass interaction with the cop and the dog in the middle of the song. And then she goes stumbles upon this Hooverville that then gets raided by the... There's, like... There is, like, half of the act one left before, like, mm -hmm. after this song. So this song is just also really ill-placed, and it's right before the grumpy side characters that don't really contribute anything to the <laughs> plot song. Like, it's just like, we just want to bite our thumb at Hoover for a second before we get back to business. And then she, the Hooverville gets raided by the cops and then she gets sent back to the orphanage and presumably beaten. And then is the whole, then that's when the daddy Warbucks plot line comes in. Like we don't even meet him until after the song. It's just, it's just garbage. And I just hate it so much. What is it from clue flames, flames on the side of my face. Um, I, I've touched on other problems that I have with the song earlier when other people were talking about it. I just, yeah, I just think that there's, it just has no place. Oh, I wanted to bring up that I looked up what Andrea McArdle did after Annie, and she did not perform again until six years later when wow. she was in the ensemble in a tour of Jerry's Girls. Wow. And then she did some regional stuff um, she played Annie Oakley in Annie Get Your Gun, but she didn't get back to Broadway until 10 years later in Starlight Express. Wow. So she clearly did some damage yeah. to herself singing this role in Broadway and the West End for what, almost two years straight. Yeah. Um, and then she played Fontaine and Eponine, which are other roles that just destroy your voice. Yeah, mostly she just did a lot of regional stuff after that. A few Broadway things. Oh, she was in Beauty and the Beast on Broadway. She was Belle. Really? Um, I liked that musical. And oh. then she was in, 
she played she did Annie get your gun a lot. This girl's really hanging her hat on a lot of Annies over here. I was here. about to say, Couldn't yeah, get away from Annie. Yeah, and then she played Miss. She she graduated to Miss Hannigan in some local. Um, <laughs> she like, graduated. <laughs> yes. Yeah, some regional productions uh, in the in 2010. Um, so yeah, so she kind of what Toby said about you know that this song is is just a a node monster. Yeah, I think. Um, she didn't do anything for six years after this role. So like, yeah, while this is like, oh, a career defining role for stage moms and their stage daughters to get the red curly wig, chances are good that no community theater music director is going to actually teach a child how to sing this song properly. And then the end is just screaming as loud as you can the same note three times. And ooh, I just... I, I'm not a singer in that way, uh, but that just hurts to think about. It hurt me to listen to. And I also feel like the 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 pacing of the song is very much for undeveloped lungs. Um, I just stick out my chin and grin and say, you know, yeah, like yeah. It, there's a lot of space for breath for these little tiny lungs that have no business scrouting these notes yes, yes. to do to get air when they they're also not being taught to breathe properly to scream these songs. So I just, I just have, I just hate it. I just hate it. Your lungs, your mm-hmm. lungs aren't yeah. big enough. Right. You got yeah. these tiny baby lungs. Tiny baby. I mean, L- Lindsay, you said something that actually I hadn't thought about, but it kind of shines a light on why I, th- I think I also think this blows is it's placement. <laughs> it's placement within the act. You're mm-hmm. right. Is that tomorrow in a better version of this musical is a act one finale, pure yes, and simple. It is. Like that song as the culmination, again, with a different kind of pacing and a show that isn't about what it's about. <laughs> so literally it's just not Annie, but like, like if Strauss had like placed this as an act one finale and maybe universalized it in some capacity, you know, maybe it's the song for all the kids to sing together yes. about their yeah. hope for their futures. I mean, like this is not rocket science to make this better, but the idea that's a really smart insight. Like it's not, it's not placed as a, an I want song. It's not placed as an, as a finale. It's just in this weird place. Yeah. She's just wandering singing to a fucking about... mongrel dog. Yeah. Well, it's it's yeah. clearly a, it's a, it's a throw in. I mean, like we said, he had written the song for yeah, something else. he wanted else. this song. He was like, again, it took from 14 months to finish this. They're probably like a week out from the premiere in Connecticut or whatever. And it's like, shit, we need another song here. Oh, I got this other thing here. <laughs> Throw it in there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's possible. It just, yeah, it just kind of, because it finally does build to something, right? So you have the build and then the crash after the first verse. Then you have the build and the semi crash into swelling trumpets and then segue to dialogue and then it comes back and then it finally does build to the end so like we've we've been through the spin class of this song like we've (laughs) we've powered hard and then we've rested and then we've did the hill climb and we rested again and so yeah it just and then it, it it and then it ultimately builds to a crashing finish or a a smashing it's exciting. The end of the song is exciting. It's it's awful to listen to because it, every child that has ever sung it has been flat. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. Including Broadway. Oh yeah. But it has this exciting finish, and then it's just like hobos. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, drop a curtain on that terrible third iteration screaming of the same note. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm maybe excited for Act Two instead of leaving at intermission. Can we yeah. can we write our own musical called Hobos the Musical? Yes, let's do it. Into that, that sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> I'm also I'm also thinking that I'd want to start a band called Little Baby Lungs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think we can all agree uh, that uh, children singing is terrible. And this is a particularly bad example of that. <laughs> yes. So unless unless there's anything else, I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, for fans of Hayden's YouTube corner, you're not going to get that today because he's not here. 
and Lindsay yelling was sort of the replacement for that. Yeah, I did not. I did not dare to watch YouTube about this. I'm sure the not comments uh, on on this on any video about this song were probably pretty awful. Listener, treat yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go, go, go. Do your own research on this one. We'll throw it back on you, uh, Lindsay. Thanks for joining us again. This time on a song you hate. Mm-hmm. And Toby, thank you for joining us the first time and lending us your expertise on the world of musical theater. Happy to be here. Yeah, we'll have you back on sometime soon. Again, listeners, thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you again next time. This Song Sucks is brought to you by the Alabama Take. Follow us on Instagram at This Song Sucks Pod and find our blog at thealabamatake.com. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can even email us at thissongsuckspod at gmail.com.